Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for choosing me or for failing to choose somebody else. I'm Simon Anholt. In 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the good country uh, and um, where it comes from. About 15 years ago, I started doing a peculiar job advising uh, the governments of countries, mostly other countries, on something which I call engagement which is a general euphemism for the way in which they engage with other countries and with the international community. And for years and years and years, I traveled backwards and forwards around the world, talking to governments about how they could engage more effectively with the rest of the world, whether that was culturally, politically, economically, even occasionally militarily. And after a few years, I noticed that I was getting very depressed on the way home. And I began to realize the reason for that because I picked up the newspaper on the plane and I started reading about the planet melting I discovered that we'd actually broken the weather and that countries were fighting and people were killing each other all in the name of nationhood and in a funny kind of way I was making it worse because what I was doing was supporting a very old-fashioned system really and truly a 17th or 18th century system in which nation states compete against each other and battle against each other in every way they know how in order to steal a march on the other countries and gain more development, more growth, more profile, more power, whatever it was they were after. And it suddenly occurred to me that actually competition is quite useful up to a certain point and then beyond that point it becomes destructive. And when you reach that certain point what you really want is for that competition to slowly merge into collaboration and cooperation. And in many, many other areas we've done that. We've been obliged to do that by globalization. Because globalization has been extremely effective at globalizing and multiplying and enhancing and augmenting all the problems in the world which were previously local and are now global. So globalization has worked very well on problems, but it hasn't yet worked very well on the solutions. Reason? Because we're still a collection of warring nation states. So I began to think to myself, I've become part of the problem. And how do you become part of the solution? Well, by talking to countries and explaining to them that actually they can get so much further if they work together more and worry a little bit less about competing. But this, of course, requires a change in culture. And this is where I began to think about <coughs> culture change. And a sort of an idea, I really hate to use the word mission because it sounds so self-serving, but I can't think of a better one for it will allow me to use the word mission with a very, very small M. The mission began to creep up on me that actually a new culture change was required. Because what we needed was we needed national leaders to start understanding that they have, in the age of globalization, a new mandate, a double mandate. The single mandate is the one that they've always had, which is that they have to represent the interests of their own people and they have to represent the interests of their own slice of territory. That's how we elect them, and that's what we ask them to do. Look after us and the people who hold the same passports. Look after our own territory, and others will look after the rest. In the age of globalization, that no longer works. And what's necessary is that governments understand that they now have a dual mandate. Every leader, and I don't just mean politicians, I mean the leaders of companies as well, local government, national government, regional government, they're responsible not just for their own people, but for every man, woman, and child on the planet. They're responsible not just for their own slice of territory, but for the entire surface of the terrestrial globe. Now, most politicians, when I suggest that to them, fall about laughing. And they say, you've got to be kidding. I have enough trouble trying to represent the often competing interests of my own population and deal with my own limited territory without having to worry about every man, woman, and child on the planet. Seven billion? billion? Are you kidding me? But of course, I don't mean that they should all be given equal priority. That would be daft. I fully understand that politicians will always prioritize their own citizens and prioritize their own slice of territory. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. But the culture change that I'm after is to get to the stage in a few years, two years, five years, I hope not much longer than that, where people will understand that, indeed, it is impossible embarrassing, disgraceful, shameful to have a discussion about any policy issue whatsoever, no matter how local that policy issue is, 
without remembering the needs of the rest of the world's population and the rest of the world's territory. That's a culture change. It's a little bit like racism and sexism. 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was still relatively common, even in developed countries, for politicians to have conversations about policy and to lapse casually, perhaps even unconsciously, into sexist or racist speech. Now, 15, 20 years later, that's become less and less common. It still needs work, but it's a whole lot less common than it used to be. And in many countries, it's actually an imprisonable offense. That's progress. I'm suggesting that the culture change we should be looking at next is to achieve the same thing for nationalism as we've achieved for racism and sexism. That we're constantly on the alert for any leader discussing any issue and slipping in that element of national self-interest as if their own population somehow or other had some mystical priority over the rest of the world's population or their own territory was somehow mystically more important than any other part of the world's surface. Because we all fall into this trap of treating and measuring and managing countries as if they were somehow islands, as if they were somehow not connected to everything else on the planet, as if each one happily inhabited its own little private solar system. But if globalization has achieved one thing, it is to prove beyond any shadow of doubt that that's no longer the case. Last time I checked, this was a closed system. This planet is a zero-sum game. And we've definitely reached the stage now where all-out competition between nations is going to make things worse and worse and worse. We need to start mixing it in with cooperation and collaboration in much higher doses. So how are we going to do that? Five minutes to tell you. Well, the first thing I did back in uh, June uh, last year was I released an index called the Good Country Index, which was a provocation. This first edition is very much a, a beta edition. It's very imperfect. It's uh, uh, highly controversial, which is kind of what I wanted. But what it tries to do is it tries to measure, insofar as the data allows it, exactly how much each nation on Earth contributes to the rest of humanity. Bizarrely, this is something that nobody's ever tried to measure before. There are thousands and thousands of indices and rankings out there, as I'm sure you know. I'm sick to death of them. This may be the last ranking that anybody ever gets away with releasing, and I'm not sure I have got away with it. But there you go. They all do the same thing. They measure countries looking inwards, as I say. They microscope rather than telescope. And they always measure countries as if they were separate systems with no impact on anything else. So I thought it's about time we had a look, not at what countries do domestically, but at what their impacts are beyond their own borders. Are they actually contributors to humanity and to the planet, or are they free riders on the global system, and as such should be recognized? So what I did with a colleague of mine was we gathered together all of the available data, most of it in the public domain, which measures more or less accurately what countries' impact is on the rest of the world. We found 35 very good, big, robust data sets centering around about 2010. That was the last year in which they were all updated. It's mostly UN data, and we can apply it to 125 countries. And because the media loves a ranking, we put the scores together and we made a ranking out of it. We divided it by GDP. We tried various experiments for normalizing the data, because all countries are, of course, a very different size and different sized economies and populations and so forth. Having normalized it by GDP, we discovered to our surprise and delight that the goodest country on Earth, and I say goodest because it's different from best, of course, the goodest country on Earth is Ireland. Good is the opposite of selfish. And I found it particularly touching that in 2010, the year in which Ireland's government debt was, the, was at its highest, this country still managed to remember its obligations to the rest of humanity to the extent of contributing more per dollar per euro of GDP than any other country on earth. Finland came a very close second. Now, it was perhaps a little tactless of me to release the Good Country Index on Independence Day with the United States coming 21st. But actually, that's a pretty creditable ranking. And no doubt, if I, hadn't, uh, if I hadn't divided these results by GDP, the US would have come a great deal higher. But I was interested in finding out what nations contribute to humanity in proportion to what they have to contribute, not their total contribution. 
Anyway, it was a very interesting ranking. Kenya, by the way, came 26th, which uh, helped to prove a very important point for me, which is that this has got nothing very much to do with how much money you've got. It's got something to do with your attitude and your culture and your sense of belonging in the global community. So in that respect, Kenya is a very modern country, much more so than many others. So there was the ranking, and it created an enormous amount of interest and an enormous amount of anger. Um, most of the anger coming from young American males, by the way, who sent me about 11,600 emails telling me that I was a queer, commie, European bastard. And if we weren't grateful for, to them for having saved us from the Japanese, a chapter of history I wasn't familiar with, the communists and the fascists, then they weren't going to do it again. Well, I sympathize, but I repeat, 21st is a pretty good rank. It shows you are a net contributor to humanity, which, of course, the United States is. But it's a large country, and it also does an awful lot of harm. And I think it's important to start measuring these things. So that was the Good Country Index. And um, to my sincere surprise, the TED talk I gave uh, in Berlin to launch this index um, clocked up uh, 1.7 million views very quickly. Nobody was more surprised about this than the TED organizers themselves, who said it was the fastest growing useless talk they'd ever published. That's a technical distinction, by the way. A useful talk is the self-help one that tells you how to win friends and influence people. They go up to 12 million straight away. This is a useless one, which just talks about global affairs generally. And it was the fastest growing useless talk they'd ever published. So I thought, OK, well, what's next? And what had been in the planning for some time was the idea of trying to convert this into some kind of a movement with a very small M, and even smaller M than the word mission I used before. Basically, I did a little bit more research, and I thought to myself, I wonder how many people around the planet feel the same way as I do. In other words, that global issues are somehow more important than national issues that the fate of humanity is somehow just as important, if not maybe slightly more important, than local domestic party politics. And I thought, how can I find out how many people like that there are? So I went to the Human Values Survey, a survey which is very useful because it asks a lot of penetrating questions of a very large number of people around the world, such as, would you rather live next door to a homosexual or a mass murderer? And from the answers of those questions, we can find out quite a lot about people's attitudes. We picked out the questions that seemed to uh, point to a cosmopolitan or global view, and I discovered to my delight that about 10% of the world's population, a very conservative estimate, is broadly speaking of a cosmopolitan mindset. That's 700 million people. So 700 million people are the people that I want to try and collect together so that we can start giving a voice to the people who care as much or more about the global issues as the domestic local ones. Above and beyond party politics, who's really thinking about issues that have an impact on all the countries? Because you can vote on the NHS, or you can vote on uh, pensions, but you can't vote on climate change. You can't vote on who drills for oil in the Arctic. You can't vote on human rights in other countries. The whole huge sphere of what goes on internationally and what really affects the future of the human race is an area over which none of us have any influence whatsoever. Sure, we can give a few pounds to a charity, we can sign a large petition, but in the end, we really need more influence than that. We need to club together and make ourselves heard. So that gave rise to the Good Country Party. Party is a bit of a joke because it doesn't exist inside any country. It exists in the space between countries, in the international space. Therefore, we can't stand for election. But if anybody says, well, that's not a party, I say, well, a party is a place where you meet people who you like and stand around drinking. So by that definition, it's a perfectly adequate party as far as I'm concerned. So I launched this at TEDx Amsterdam in November. 15,000 people tried to join in the first 24 hours. The website promptly fell over, and I thought to myself, hmm, maybe that wasn't such a bad idea after all. So here I am today. End of my time. I just wanted you to know about the Good Country Party and keep your eye open for it. Thank you.